So I'm very, very excited to have Will Oliver here today. He is one of the giants in the field of superconducting circuits. And I think he's got his fingers into just about all of the pies, fabrication development, 3D integration, coherence times, unconventional qubits. Um, but he's also got a very interesting body of work on waveguide QED and photon mediated um, entanglement protocols and things like that, which is, I think, particularly close to our AMO hearts here at JQI. So he's not just going to talk about interface losses and two-level systems today. Um, and so with that, I think I should let Will give his talk, but we're very excited to have him here. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you very much. Um, can I just check that I'm audible um, on Zoom? You are. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. Thanks, Alicia, for that kind introduction and for showing me some really fantastic data over the last hour. It's really, really great to see. Um, I, I'm going to stand here if that's okay, because I can use this uh, pointer and hopefully the folks on Zoom can see that. Um, I'd like to tell you about some work that's still ongoing. It started a couple years ago, and I'll show some latest results, which we haven't published yet. Hopefully will soon. But the general topic is something called giant artificial atoms and molecules. I'll define what we mean by that. And then time permitting, there's some work that I'd like to share that's unrelated to the waveguide QED, but work that we did with Charlie, Tahan, and Yuri Vianney that I'd like to highlight as well. Um, before I get into this, though, um, this work was done in um, collaboration with Anton Frisk Kokum and Franco Nori. Um, and I'd also like to give thanks to Yasu Nakamura and his group who uh, did some of the early theory on the device that I'm going to talk about today. So first off, small atoms. Uh, we're talking about, I'm going to talk about giant atoms, but let's just take a step back and define what we mean by a small atom. A small atom, at least in the context here, is going to be an atom whose spatial extent is small compared to the wavelength of light. Okay, that's used to drive it. And this ultimately leads to the dipole approximation. Uh, we can think of the atom as point-like, in a classical picture, in fact, the polarization of the atom is basically riding the waves that drive it. Okay, this is the dipole approximation. And a lot of, of course, atoms that we know in life uh, follow this, natural atoms, optical light, the radius is, you know, angstrom level. We drive it with, say, a laser, might be submicron. Um, and the ratio there is 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4. So, so good approximation. Now, you might think that Rydberg atoms are not small because we know that when we highly excite an atom into a Rydberg state, its spatial extent gets very large. But of course, frequency also goes down. And so now we're driving it in the microwave regime. And if we look at the ratio um, there, it's actually deeper into the point-like regime, 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 6. And superconducting qubits similarly are small in this sense, although they're quite large, 100 microns extent, we're driving them with RF and microwaves. And the ratio here is one in 100 to one in 1,000. So all of these are examples of what we might call small atoms. But with superconducting qubits, we can make giant atoms because basically we get to define how we couple our qubit to the light that we're using to drive it. And so we're going to say a giant atom is um, a qubit or an atom that's large enough uh, that we couple to it to its driving field on the order of a wavelength in multiple locations, okay? And so when we do that, we can no longer think of just a dipole approximation because which, which you know, in a classical sense, which part of the field am I going to be following at any given time? And this leads to interference effects between the emission and absorption at different points. Um, so the upshot here is that we're gonna leverage superconducting qubits, their size, uh, the ability to connect them to the driving field at various points, and quantum interference to realize high fidelity operations in a waveguide uh, QED context. And but what I mean by waveguide is we're really coupling the qubit to an open environment. Okay, and nonetheless, we're able to do high fidelity operations by tailoring this quantum interference. So um, they're basically two topics here I'd like to talk about, uh, waveguide QED and giant artificial atoms, that's one qubit, and then directional or chiral photon emission where we use multiple qubits, you might think of it as a giant molecule, and then time permitting at the end, some work that we've done with Charlie on qubit arrays. Um, this first work though was done by Bharath Kanan, who is a 
um, PhD student in the group. He's now uh, CEO of Atlantic Quantum, a startup. And Dan Campbell, who um, was a postdoc and is now at AFRL in Rome. Uh, I would be remiss to not give the very brief review of what a superconducting qubit is. So um, the simplest quantum circuit, of course, is an LC circuit, L inductor, C is a capacitor. This is a harmonic oscillator, simple harmonic oscillator. And um, we can count the excitation zero, one, two in this system. Uh, the hallmark here is that the potential is parabolic. It's a harmonic oscillator. And so although this is a quantum system, if we lower the temperature such that KT is much less than the resonance frequency, uh, it's not a qubit because when we drive any particular transition, uh, in fact, we're driving all of them. So we drive ourselves out of the zero one subspace very quickly. So we have to do something to change the harmonicity. And we do that by adding a nonlinear element called a Josephson junction, which is a tunnel junction with superconducting materials separated by a thin insulating barrier. For the context here, we think of it just as a nonlinear inductor. So these are the Josephson relations uh, right here for current and voltage. But if we combine them in the usual way to define an inductance, we find that this Josephson inductance is highly nonlinear in the current going through the tunnel junction. So a linear inductor doesn't matter how much current goes through it. It's always the same inductance. But here with a tunnel junction, uh, the inductance varies with the current. And the higher the current, the higher the inductance. So this is a nonlinear inductor. We can then calculate from the, I, the current and voltage relationship the energy potential. And we see that it's anharmonic. It goes as a cosine. And by just replacing that inductor with a nonlinear one called the Josephson junction, we create what you might think of as our hydrogen atom. It's the simplest qubit we've got called a transmon, a fixed frequency transmon. And you can see that the potential in blue here now follows a cosine rather than the parabolic um, dash red line. And the consequence of that for what we care about is that the zero one transition frequency now differs from the one, two and the two, three, et cetera. So we really can draw a box around zero and one, say that is my qubit and we can, um, let's see, why did this freeze? There we go. We can drive, excuse me, drive the zero one transition independently of the one two, okay? So there are lots of artificial atoms that can be built from this concept. They don't just have one junction and one capacitor, um, but we're gonna use the transmon here, um, a slight variant of it. Okay, so now cavity QED is the way that we typically measure and control these uh, transmon qubits. Um, and the reason we do that, this should be a pretty familiar picture here, is that the cavity protects the qubit from its environment. Um, and if we just put that cavity in an open waveguide or an open environment, it would decay very quickly. So we put it inside of a cavity and the cavity alters the modes that the qubit sees. And if you go on resonance with one of those modes, in fact, for cell effect will enhance the decay into that mode. Uh, it's Q enhanced, quality factor enhanced. So we detune from that. When we're detuned, we're protected. And this is the dominant architecture today. So you might ask why go back to a waveguide QED um, architecture where we're coupling qubits to an open waveguide with a quasi continuum of modes, which are all ready to grab that energy and take it away. Okay. Um, the reason is that we're thinking ahead to quantum interconnects. For example, if we have two chips and we want to communicate between those two chips, how can we do it? Well, we would like to emit a photon from one chip to the other chip, but if we have a cavity or mirrors there, that's going to impede the uh, communication of that photon and it will come out randomly over some period of time, right? And so a direct connection would be better, but the questions that we have to then answer are, how do we avoid this always on strong dissipation of the 50 ohm waveguide impedance, in this case, let's say it's 50 ohms. And if we can overcome that, can we then engineer interactions that are mediated by the waveguide while we still ignore the dissipation of the environment? Okay, so those, those are the questions that we wanted to answer. It's a broad field waveguide QED, and I won't read through this entire slide, but just to say that we certainly didn't invent it. And uh, we're coming into a field that's fairly mature. Um, for example, I'll show some um, our version of this data, but Astavia et al. were the first to do um, experiments of one atom in waveguide QED. Uh, interactions are shown here. Um, the microwave quantum optics techniques to measure those photons 
uh, even atomic cavities, EIT, ultrastar and coupling. There's been a lot of work uh, in the field. And this is just a few uh, that can fit onto a slide. So we're building on this work, of course. So we're fortunate um, with superconducting qubits that we're basically quasi one dimensional. And to, to illustrate that, let's step back to the real world. We live in three dimensions and free space. And let's say we have an atom in free space and we drive that atom in the usual way with a plane wave. Um, this of course is a point, but it's drawn here large to, uh, to just so that we can see it. That excites the atom. So it absorbs energy from the plane, plane wave, but when it emits, it will emit spherically in all directions. And so that leads to uh, very nice interference patterns. Okay, that's beautiful, but it's a poor spatial mode matching. Um, and so with superconducting qubits, we are fortunate in that we are coupling to essentially a one dimensional waveguide. Uh, photons can go left or right. So if we drive this qubit that's um, coupled to this waveguide, it will absorb energy and then it will emit. And when it emits, of course, it emits in all directions, but all directions here just means left or right. Okay, and then there's quantum interference. And if we're driving it on average with one or less photons um, at a time, in fact, the forward propagation completely destructively interferes and there's perfect reflection. And we'll see that in just a moment. Okay, now, one other thing to think about is that, you know, in general, with, a, with an atom in free space, there's a um, small scattering cross-section. Okay, the overlap matrix element is small, and you might wonder about that here. Um, particularly in cavity QED, we talk about the cooperativity, cavity enhancement times the um, electromagnetic field overlap. Here we have no cavity, right? So basically that's one. Um, but we can choose with superconducting qubits how strongly we couple to the waveguide. It's basically a capacitor. And if we want more coupling, we just increase the value of the capacitance. And so we can more than overcome the lack of a cavity and still get into the strong coupling regime where our coupling rate to this waveguide is much stronger than what we'll call non-radiative relaxation, which is basically relaxation to everywhere other than the waveguide. Okay, so we can enter this regime. So with superconducting qubits, oh, here's oh, the idea. Uh, this is Bill Phillips. Now, normally, when we think about cooperativity, we think about um, a, a quantity that's proportional to omega squared over kappa gamma. Now, here you've just told us about gamma. What's the equivalent of kappa here? Yeah, so I'm ignoring the kappa here because of the lack of a cavity, right? That there's no there's no mirrors here. Right. So, okay. so how would I... Um, so is the cooperativity omega over gamma now, or what? Yeah, so I don't have the uh, form of the equation right here. I'm just making an intuition that uh, we don't have the cavity, but we we can almost arbitrarily increase the strength uh, right. of the... Uh, right, so that's uh, the omega. So it's just the ratio of omega to gamma now is the thing that's the equivalent of cooperativity. Probably, yep. Okay. Okay. Gamma over gamma NR. Gamma over gamma Over coupling to any other modes, and that could be incredibly huge. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we couple these qubits to this open waveguide. Um, the strength of the coupling is gamma. The frequency is omega, and then we have non-radiative relaxation. We might have one or multiple. Getting one step closer to reality, the qubits themselves now, if you look at this, it has two junctions in the form of a squid. There's a loop. And by putting a magnetic field through that loop, we can tune the qubit frequency. That's why we do that. We would like to be able to tune it. But otherwise, this is just a transmon. And drawn here are three of them uh, coupled to a 50 ohm waveguide. Now it's drawn here schematically as a coax. Of course, we don't actually make it out of a coax. Um, rather, we make it what's called a coplanar waveguide. So basically, you have a center trace, and then you have ground plane on either side, and the electric field goes from the center trace to the ground plane. Okay, so this is the 50 ohm coplanar waveguide shown here. 
the cubic capacitor, rather than being a parallel plate, is lateral. And the square in the middle is one of the plates. And then the ground plane on the outside uh, is the other plate of that capacitor. The capacitor is large compared to the junctions. You have to zoom into this loop here, and you can see the two junctions here. And it is the magnetic field that threads that loop that allows us to tune the qubit frequency. This is an antenna that brings in a current to do that. And we have one other drive line here, which is how we can drive the qubit at RF or microwave frequencies, drive transitions in that qubit. So one of the first experiments we did just to show that the system is working is to put one qubit coupled to a waveguide and connect it to a network analyzer. Now this experiment is done in a dilution refrigerator at roughly 20 millikelvin. And with the network analyzer, we'll send a signal out port one, we'll attenuate it on the way down. It comes in, interacts with the qubit, and then um, we'll look at how much is transmitted through the waveguide, we'll reamplify it and arrives at port two. That's a very simple experiment that we could do. And remember we said that if you're in the limit where the average photon number arriving uh, at this atom is much less than one, then we expect perfect reflection and zero transmission if this is working properly. And that's basically what we see. So this is the magnitude of S21 squared. That's the amount of power that's getting to port two of this network analyzer. And we're detuning around resonance um, the tone that comes from the network analyzer. And when it's on resonance, you can see that to about one part in 10,000, nothing gets through, right? And when you're off resonance, then of course this perfect uh, destructive interference doesn't happen and the photons continue on and approach unity. This is normalized. You can do this in two dimensions. Or, um, you can scan both the detuning frequency as well as the probe power. The dashed line here is what I'm showing on the left. But if I take a vertical slice here on resonance, and look at it as a function of power, at low power, nothing gets transmitted because we're in this limit where there's far less than one photon on average. But eventually, if we increase the power enough, um, we'll start to see transmission occur. And the intuition is that while one photon is interacting with the atom, lots of other photons just go right on by. Okay, so, so this follows what we expect. Um, with superconducting qubits first done by Astafiev et al. at NEC, but of course this goes back uh, even to the 1970s. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, yep. Once again, so this sounds an awful lot like uh, what one the the story one would tell if you um, uh, had a strongly absorbing medium, and then uh, if you saturate it, then uh, uh, light gets through. If you don't saturate it, then uh, nothing gets through. Is that all this is, or is there more to it? Um, so I think as long as the, I, I think as long as the um, quantum interference is playing a role in what's being transmitted, I think that that's fine for this story here. Okay. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to try and look at is um, how do we prevent these qubits from emitting to this uh, 50 ohm environment of the waveguide? And so what we did is we took two qubits, qubits A and B, and we capacitively coupled them to the waveguide at these discrete points, and we separated those points by a phase five. Now, we don't really have direct control over that phase, um, by setting the phase, but what we can do is when we design the qubits, we can say how far apart they are spatially, delta x. We also know that there's a velocity to the photon. Um, it's about the thir a third of the speed of light here. And then there's the frequency of that photon. Now, when we fabricate, those qubits are fixed on a substrate, so they don't move. Uh, the velocity is fixed, but we can, tune the, we can tune the frequency. So that's how we tune the phase. This is what the device looks like. We have two qubits. They're shown in yellow, the capacitor anyways. There's one, here's the other one. And the waveguide, you can see it meanders back and forth from qubit A to qubit B, back to qubit A, back to qubit B, and then to the output. And if we zoom in on it, say this qubit here, qubit B, you can see that it's coupled to the waveguide at two locations. Um, this is the small inductor down here. And um, 
We also included the conventional cavity-based readout. That was basically an experimental check for us to make sure that we knew what was going on, but doesn't really play a role here in the experiment. So we're going to probe by looking at um, what goes in and out of the waveguide. OK, so we can tune dissipation. And the way that we can describe that is shown here. We're going to detune qubit B so that it's far off resonance with qubit A. And now we're just going to focus on qubit A. And we can put qubit A in its excited state. And it will decay quickly. OK, and we can ask how that happens. So there's one path where qubit A emits to the left, OK? And it will quickly go to this 50 ohm environment. But the other path is that qubit A could emit towards the right and then find its way back to the environment um, through this additional path, which is longer by 2 phi, OK? And so depending on the value of phi, we can either suppress or enhance that spontaneous emission. And of course, the one that we want is to suppress it so that effectively qubit A doesn't see that 50 ohm environment. So that, that is the phase that we choose, again, by tuning the qubit's frequency such that that happens. Now, the same thing happens to this 50 ohms on the right, but it's the same interference condition. And so by doing this, we can effectively tune out the 50 ohm environment. It's not seen by the qubit anymore. And that happens at this one particular point in frequency. That's the qubit frequency or the phase. Um, and what I'm plotting here is the decay rate gamma 1, 1 over T1. And so as soon as I detune in frequency from that point, where I'm changing the phase, I start to see more and more dissipation to that 50 ohm environment. If you prefer T1 decays, that's what's shown here is that we put the qubit in its excited state and record how long it remains there. And this longest decay time of about 30 microseconds is pretty standard for this type of transdom. OK, so basically, we've turned off the dissipation to the 50 ohms. And of course, there's still all the other decay channels internal to the qubit that are still there. OK. So we showed that we can turn off the dissipation to 50 ohms. Now, can we can they have the qubits interact with one another while still keeping that off? And so again, here's that same setup. And I won't go into the details behind this, but the interaction between qubit A and B depends on couplings between pairs of nodes, as you might expect. And it goes as the coupling rate gamma divided by two times the sine of that phase. OK, and you can see that there are three pairs of adjacent nodes where this could happen. There's also the leftmost node to the rightmost node, which is separated by 3 phi. That's the only difference. Now, this is a coherent process. And so all of those need to add together. And so the net coupling G between qubits A and B goes as gamma over 2 and the sum of these uh, sinusoidal phases. And so we can do a test just to show that this works. Um, we hold one qubit at a fixed frequency. And then we tune the frequency of the other qubit. And when they come on resonance, there's an avoided crossing, right? There's an exchange um, interaction that's happening here. And the strength is uh, g over pi, or 2g over 2 pi, if you prefer. OK, so they can certainly talk to each other via the waveguide. But what's interesting is that that particular frequency where they're talking to each other and exchanging information can also be this decoherence free point where they don't listen to the environment. They don't talk to it at all. So we have waveguide mediated interactions while the qubit is decoupled from its environment, despite the fact that this is quasi continuum of modes, completely open environments. OK. So we can engineer, now that we know the the, the rules, we can engineer the coupling spectra. The first thing we can do is change how many points we're connecting the qubit to the waveguide. I just showed two. Um, and that gave one minima, one decoherence-free point. Um, but we could add a second one, or a third, sorry, a third coupling point. And that now gives us two minima at different phases. And it continues on like this, n minus one minima for n coupling points. OK, so that's one thing we can do. The second thing is that we don't need all of those couplings to be equal, right? We could change one coupling or one with respect to the others. And so if we change the one in green here with respect to the other two and the ratio is shown, 
you can go from something that looks like a double well um, to something that flattens out as you increase that ratio. Okay, so that's another knob we have. And of course, the third knob that we've also talked about is I can choose the phases between any pair coupling points. Okay, so, so with that, we designed a device with three coupling points, qubit A and qubit B. They're cu each coupled at three places. And you can see the phases along here at the bottom. So they're not equal, we change them. And the coupling strengths are represented by the size of the dot. I'll give numbers in just a moment. This is the device. Okay, it looks the same in terms of the qubit, but now the waveguide in blue meanders back and forth more times. And you can see when we zoom in that there um, are three coupling points to this capacitor. And in fact, one of them is stronger than the other two. So um, to give some numbers, uh, phi one is about the same as phi three, is half of phi two in this diagram. And then one of the coupling points gamma two is about four times gamma one, all right? So with that device, what we, we mapped it out, and you can see that indeed there are two minima, that's where the decay rate goes essentially to zero through the waveguide. And it happens at two discrete frequencies that are different. Okay, that's important because we're gonna park a qubit at each one where they're not, the qubits aren't resonant, but they're each decoupled from the environment. And then at those frequencies, you can see that we still have the qubits can talk to each other when they're resonant, when they're resonant. If they're off resonance, they don't talk to each other, basically. Okay, so here's the experiment. We start with um, qubit A and qubit B each, qubit B each at their own decoherence free frequency. They're parked there. They don't talk to the environment. We then put qubit, well, let me say first, we've initialized them in a ground state. We then put qubit B in its excited state. We'll then shift qubit A onto resonance with qubit B. We bring it over to the other, to where qubit B is. Now they're both decoupled from the environment, but they talk to each other. There's an exchange interaction. We then shift um, qubit A back to its original point, still protected from the environment, and we do readout. And what we see is a standard swap operation where qubits A and B swap uh, energy with one another. And if you, you know, take, take the on resonance version of this 2D plot, you see how they exchange. And if we pick this point right here, um, where there's half an excitation in each, coherently this should form an entangled state. And it does, an I swap gate or an I swap operation, zero one minus I one zero. And when we do tomography on that, we find that the fidelity is about 94%. Now, that's not a world record for superconducting qubits. The gates can now be higher than 99% or more, but those are qubits in a cavity. They're protected, right? These are qubits which see free space, basically, uh, in one dimension. So, so this, is, this was one of our first demonstrations that we can actually do waveguide QED um, with an open environment and still achieve high fidelities. So we can entangle these qubits despite the strong coupling to an open environment. The coupling rate is strong enough that it would be hard to even, you know, put one of the qubits in its excited state, it would start decaying immediately. You know, to try to set up this entangled state would be very, very difficult without the techniques that I just described. Okay, so let me move on now from a giant artificial atom to um, oh, Charlie, yeah, yeah. What's the point of this decoherence free point? I missed that. Oh, yeah. So Charlie's asking, what's the frequency? What's the point that sets that decoherence free point? And it's, it's, it's basically that the qubit can emit in multiple directions and uh, uh, multiple points along the waveguide. So you're just creating an interference effect where that's a cancellation point. That's right. And Qubits that have achieved super fidelity and high fidelity starting cavity. Is that true? Are all are all like Google architecture? All each qubit is not in the cavity, right? So is that true or well, they're coupled to a cavity, I should say. Okay. That's right. Yeah, they're coupled to a cavity. Um, importantly, they're not coupled to an open waveguide. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's a better statement. Yeah, yeah, that's a better statement. Yeah, thank you. The readout is performed by a uh, cavity. Yes. Uh, so you started to talk with this uh, dipole approximation, right? 
So usually I think of like SP transition and, and AD transition, and SD is not about the system. Uh, but the qubit here is still a two level system. Mm -hmm. It's always an SP transition that you're looking at. Okay. My question was that is it possible that, uh, that the model is actually a two level system, but then I'm coupling to multiple modes of a cavity? Let's say the atomic version of it. Okay. And then the other atom is coupling, uh, is coupled to those modes, but in a different phase configuration. My, so, a specific question is that is it possible to have like an alternative Hamiltonian that I write, still a two level system, so there is no S2D transition or whatever. So, the okay. internal state is two. But then I'm I'm coupling in multiple like multiple modes of the cavity to this single atom. I guess you could probably think of it this way. I mean, what we're essentially doing is turning down or increasing the transmissivity of the mirrors, and then these, you know, basically these modes are coming closer and closer together. In this limit, they're basically a quasi-continuum. There's probably something that happens before then, and maybe this is what you're also describing. Yeah. And that, you know, if you can by hand, create that coupling to these different modes of the cavity, then you know maybe there's a description that works that way. Yeah. Okay, um, sure. Like, so the original level C2, like, oh, I'm sorry, could you speak louder, please? Oh, yeah, so the question is, what about the T2 times, or the dephasing in particular? Yeah, the dephasing time here is, um, Similar, well, the T2 times similar. So dephasing is about twice as long as T1. Yeah, similar. Yep. So uh, my question is, you motivated this about uh, using waveguides. So you'd have an interconnect, so if something far away, you could send photons down a waveguide, they'd be absorbed into these yeah. qubits, et cetera. Um, and I guess what I'm confused by is the same process that you're using to make your two qubits isolate from the environment is, I, would imagine precisely the same process that means that a photon coming in from the environment, say from some qubit far away, won't be absorbed into these into these qubits. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perfect question and good segue. Was there another question in the back? Uh, yeah. So I wonder if you have multiple qubits, the system would have multiple photons that would be effect to the quantity. So if those photons are at different frequencies, one could imagine having a frequency multiplexed version of this, right? But at the same frequency, if multiple photons arrive in an atom, the atom absorbs one on resonance, right? So um, the other photon has to go somewhere else. Yeah. It is true that this would be compromised if we um, tried to do more than one um, photon. But but here, remember, we're actually using the qubit to emit a photon. So we know it's at most one. And in fact, it's a Fox state at that. Yeah. OK, thanks. OK, so I'd like to now switch over to, to um, what we're thinking about in terms of um, quantum interconnects. And it's it's a related story, but it's Rather than a single atom, it's going to be a giant molecule. Okay, and I'll describe that in a minute. We want quantum networks so that we can connect together different systems of qubits um, and be able to distribute the entanglement between computational nodes. And you know, some of this is to um, connect different chips. If you have chips or locations on a chip that are non-local to another set of qubits, you want to connect them together. You could swap, 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 which takes a lot of time, or just send one photon over. That, that's basically the motivation to do it faster. So basically, quantum interconnects for qubits. And um, you know, this, this has been done in different contexts. We certainly weren't the first. Um, one is just to couple qubits to a cavity. And this actually works really well. It's high fidelity. It's bidirectional. Um, but we're limited in the number, the amount of connectivity we can have. Um, how many qubits can I really couple to that? Um, waveguide and also the distance, right? As we make the waveguide longer and longer, the, the free spectral range changes, the modes get closer together and, and you know the fundamental gets lower and lower and maybe even lower than temperature. So there's a number of issues with that approach. 
Um, the other is to couple two basically single-ended waveguides. Um, this is versatile because it's a waveguide, but um, the idea here is that you would send a photon in one direction, um, and often um, there'll be a circulator in the middle to um, prevent photons going in the other direction. And this is one way to get around the free space issue, but it, um, but, but these non-reciprocal elements are lossy, they're large. And so this isn't quite the right way to do it either, I think. Um, and what we came up with was uh, a demonstration of a proposal by Yasu Nakamura's group a few years ago, and that's to use a giant molecule. Okay, and the idea is that we'll have two qubits, qubit one and qubit two, and we're gonna put them into an entangled state as shown here, EG plus GE. And importantly, we're going to have a phase, pi over two. It'll be positive or negative. Here, here it's positive. Let's just imagine that. And we couple these two qubits now um, to a waveguide. So it's in an entangled state. So it's a single unit coupled to a waveguide separated by lambda over four. Okay. And this entangled state or this molecule will emit a one photon. There's one excitation to the waveguide. And there are four possible paths along which this could happen. Okay, so one path is that, in fact, the first qubit, qubit one, was the one in the excited state, and it emits a photon and it goes to the right. And we can do some bookkeeping of the phases that accrue in this situation. And the first one is that um, the phase associated with the qubit state. So we'll assume that this one is uh, zero. It's an overall phase, let's say. And the second one is the position. And so I'll define x equals zero to be here. And so that's, you know, both of these phases are zero. Um, the one on the right means the photon goes right and zero on the left means zero photons go left. Now, alternatively, it could have been qubit two that was excited and it emits a photon and that photon also goes to the right. And the phases that come through now is first of all, the phase I set, pi over two, and then a minus pi over two due to the location. And that minus sign is just uh, convention. Now you can do the same thing for the two other paths where the photon goes left. But what you find is that um, these two uh, completely and destructively uh, interfere. And so the photon in this case will only go to the right. Now, Okay, so the emitted photon is zero one because it goes to the right. Now, this story is almost true, except remember we said that these two qubits talk to each other via the waveguide. And so it's, it's in some sense interacting and we need to null out that interaction. And so the way we do it is we couple these qubits together. I'll show you in a moment uh, how we do that. But we couple them in exactly opposite strength of the coupling through the waveguide itself and we null it out. And when we do that, then this simple linear description that I just described here is true. Now, if we instead change the phase to minus pi over two, the discussion follows exactly, except it's now the rightward photon that destructively interferes and only the leftward photon survives. Okay, so we basically have a way to directionally send the photon right or left, depending on the phase that we choose. Um, plus or minus pi over two. Okay, so the emitter module that we just described looks something like this. We have qubits at the bottom that are coupled to this waveguide. And again, um, these are the emitter qubits. Um, there is a coupling between them that we're using to null out the coupling via the waveguide. But these, these are not of the type that I described previously. Okay, it turns out it's in a different regime where we can't create that entangled state here. We have to create it um, non-locally. So we, we add two more qubits, three and four. And this is where we can create the entangled state. We can take as much time as we want to do it. We do that by coupling them together, um, creating the entangled state. And then we use couplers to shift that entangled state from qubits three and four down to qubits one and two, where they quickly emit to the waveguide. So this is what the device looks like. It has in total four data qubits and four couplers. Qubits one and two are coupled to this waveguide. Qubits three and four are where we create the entanglement. 
And the blue is the uh, coupler that we use. We drive it to, to create that entangled state. And then we're, when we're ready, we drive these two couplers on the left and right, and that transfers the entanglement down, swaps it down to qubits one and two, where it's quickly emitted. OK. So this is, this is how the experiment goes. All, everything starts in the ground state. We'll do a pi pulse on qubit three. We'll then parametrically drive this coupling. It's, it's Z with respect to the coupler, but it's a, a transverse coupling between three and four to create an entangled state. It's an I-swap gate, square root of I-swap. That creates the entangled state. We'll then drive these couplers to exchange that entangled state down to qubits one and two, and then they admit quickly to the waveguide. And depending on the phase, in this case, the phase is chosen so that the photon only goes to the right. Now at room temperature, we'll measure um, these photons coming out by measuring the electric field. And what we see is that when we send the photon to the right, we get this envelope. Uh, that's the photon itself. And, and if we look on the left side, nothing's coming out. And similarly, um, if we choose to send the photon to the left, we get this envelope for the photon and essentially nothing coming out the right side. So this is, this is basically showing that we can get directional emission of a photon. Um, what we're well, actually, um, uh, yep. Looking at this thing, forgetting about the qubits three and four, which are sort of a detail for, for how you get the, the entanglement that you want or the, the initial condition that you want, it looks an awful lot like uh, two antennae that are phased in such a way that you get directional emission but that picture is says nothing about the fact that these things are entangled but somehow i feel the entanglement has to be a really important part of this whole thing so enlighten me yeah well i think it, you're absolutely right that we can get a classical or quasi-classical version of this with two antennas that are properly phased and you know that's essentially what underpins a phased array but the difference here is that these are Fox states and those would be a uh, coherent state. And so the entanglement um, of course is key in the sense that we want to have a single molecule or artificial molecule or unit that is emitting a photon simultaneously to two points that are spatially non-local and then letting the interference effect ensue that is related to the relative phase in the entangled state. Okay, is this, well, this is probably a stupid question, but um, does this have any connection to the hung mandel effect? Oh, <laughs> well, no, not in the sense that um, the hung mandel effect, of course, starts with two photons, yeah. right? And then they collide at a beam splitter and will bunch um, if they're simultaneous, right, and go left or right together. Whereas in this case, we only have one photon. And so it's a single photon effect um, due to quantum interference, but there's no quantum statistics involved. Okay. But thanks for the question. Um, just to mention that we're measuring the voltage, uh, and this is a detail, I'm happy to go into it in the Q&A, but um, we're measuring the voltage at room temperature so that we can extract out the field um, operators, which we'll then use to do tomography. Um, and that, that has some implications for how we measure it, um, but I'm happy to go into those details if somebody's interested. So when we do the photon state tomography, um, what you see is along the bottom are all these field operators and various contractions therein. But the two dominant peaks that you see are a photon going to the left, and a photon going to the right. And when we um, look at the fidelity of this, it's around 95, 96% for this directional or sometimes called chiral um, emission. So th this works pretty well. And the next step is then to make a, you know, this modular network that we are, have been talking about. And this, this is work led by Aziza and Beatrice in the group. And so the concept is that you might not have just one of these emitters, but you would have say four. And the other fact, if you run the emitter in reverse, it's now an absorber. That's another nice feature of this. And so you might say, 
connect these emitters and absorbers to local QPUs, quantum processor units, and then I can basically connect them arbitrarily. And, and the idea is that I have one waveguide that would connect you know, throughout this uh, chip or multiple chips. And I can send photon from one emitter to another absorber um, by bringing these two on resonance and operating them, but the other ones I detune. Um, I could have that one be the emitter and this one be the absorber. You can run between any pairs, right? And, and what's important is that it's a waveguide. It's not a cavity. So it can almost arbitrarily be arbitrarily long. So the first test we did was, of course, with just two such modules um, that you see here. And we can send a photon from the left one to the right one and from the right one to the left one. That's the demonstration that we did. Um, and the first module we put inside its own microwave package that's shown here on the left side of this thermal finger. This is in a dilution refrigerator at the bottom uh, mixing chamber stage. So this is one package. Then the second package holds the second emitter and absorber. And then they're connected by a niobium titanium cable. Now, uh, this is, you wouldn't want to do this for real because there's lots of losses, say, at the connectors and whatnot. But for a first demonstration, we were able to show that this is sufficient. So the first step is photon shaping. And I'll, let me just acknowledge up front, this isn't absolutely required because we have control of how we shift the photon down to the emitters and how we absorb it back. We have full control of that. But it's simpler if, if we start with something that is symmetric. And so the idea is that we tune those couplers as we shift the entangled state down to the emission qubits. We can tune the rates and the strengths such that we shape the photon. And here you can see the photon. It's not perfect, but in by some metric, it's you know 97% symmetric. And we can do the same with a rightward photon emission, you know, 95, 96% symmetric. So we, we do try to tune up close to a symmetric wave packet. Now the protocol is similar, okay? We start with everything in the ground state. We then excite, this will be our emitter, this will be our absorber. We excite one of the qubits. Um, we then do the exchange coupling to create the entangled state we want, such that the photon will go to the right. And then simultaneously, we both shift it down to the emitter qubits, which sends the photon to the right. And at the same time, we're absorbing it on the um, absorber side, basically running it in reverse. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll measure the Q qubits on the absorber side to see what we got on the qubits, while also monitoring what happens at room temperature on the waveguide. If the photon wasn't absorbed, it'll just keep going. Now, if you count everything up, there's a lot of parameters to tune up here. Um, turns out 73. And so the way that we do this is using a reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, we try to get it close. We use some physics-based calibration to choose the seed pulses. Um, we then, you know, with the computer decide parameter candidates as an update, we'll send those pulses to the fridge. We run the absorption experiment. We'll then collect you know, the outputs and define a reward. The reward would be a lot is absorbed and very little goes to the, to the uh, room temperature stage. And then based on that, we update our neural network, compute new gradients and come up with a new trial. And this, this is one epoch, right, in the jargon. And after many, many epochs and training, we saturate to something which has a high reward. Okay, and that's, that's how we do the tune-up. Um, and this is very similar to what Leon Ding and Max Hayes did on this um, two qubit fluxonium gate, which exceeded three nines of fidelity, some similar type of reinforcement learning. Okay, so, so the experiment that we hope to publish soon is basically what I'll show now, which is we'll start with this emitter module. We send a qubit, or sorry, we send a photon to the right and absorb it here. Um, sorry, the first thing we do is we don't absorb it here. We just say, don't turn on the absorber. And what we find is that the photon does in fact go out to room temperature. Goes to the right, nothing goes to the left. We then turn on the absorber and you see that very little of that photon now goes to room temperature, which presumably means it was absorbed. 
Okay, but we're measuring those qubits as well, so we can see how much of it was absorbed. In fact, we see the emission as the emission happens, and we see the absorption as the absorption happens. And you can see it's not perfect. All right, there's things we still do. Um, first off, it should be 0.5 if it's an entangled state. You know, half of the photon is in number seven and half is in number eight. Um, it's suppressed from that. And second of all, they're not exactly matched, so it's not perfect. All right but it's, it's basically working. The absorbed population calculated out is about 63%. Now, if we go in the other direction, we swap roles. This is the emitter, this is the absorber. Things look a little better. First, the photon comes out the left side if we turn the absorber off. And when we turn it on, now you can see that it's much better matched. It's still reduced from half, but it's, it's better matched. And here the absorbed population is about 64%. So we can do qubit state tomography, and we find that the leftward photon has a fidelity absorption of about 0.6. The rightward is also about 0.6, and we can account for a lot of the loss. So first off, um, propagation loss is maybe 15, 16%, and that's just from the fact that there are lots of connectors on these packages and coaxes. About 10% is due to qubit decoherence. That can be improved. Um, we still have about three and a half percent directionality error, left versus right. Um, and then we can improve the absorption protocol. We're missing about six out of a hundred photons there. So wrapping it all up, the Bell state fidelities that we absorb on the absorber side is 0.6. Concurrence is also around 0.6 in both the left and the right directions as a point above 0.5. So we know that it is entangled in quantum mechanical. The error budget accounts for about 32%. And the next experiment now is to um, put the qubits on the same chip in the same package and have them talk to each other. That will eliminate at least a lot of the errors over on this side. Last experiment, and then I'll hit the top of the hour, so I'll stop there, um, is a remote entanglement experiment. Of course, what we want to do is not just show that we can send a photon from left to right and absorb it. We actually want to entangle both sides because then we can do quantum gates between non-local qubits. So here we have an emitter on the right. We send the photon to the left. And this is what the, uh, I showed this data just a moment ago. We're emitting and then we're absorbing. And so if we pick this point roughly right here, um, we can create entanglement between these two modules um, and so we're entangling four qubits, looks like a W state. Where the photon is, it could be in any one of those four qubits. Um, and there is a relative phase here related to the separation. And when we do tomography on that, what we find is it's about 62%. Um, so again, demonstrating that we have remote entanglement now between these two uh, modules. And that, that's basically where we are today. Um, we're starting to write this up in parallel with now measuring that chip that's got both of them, uh, both, both emitter and absorber on the same chip. And so with that, I think I'm going to conclude. I don't have time to go through this. I'm sorry, Charlie. The, the work that Charlie and I did together, <laughs> I won't have time to talk about with qubit arrays. Um, but, but basically that story is we were able to, on a 16 qubit array uh, chip, measure the change from area law type entanglement to volume law type entanglement um, of those 16 qubits. And um, we'll be happy to talk about that perhaps uh, over lunch. But with that, let me just quickly fast forward to the end so I can show all the people who helped with this experiment. Sorry, I know this is annoying. <laughs> there we are. Um, so the work was done at MIT in the Engineering Quantum Systems Group. Um, and in close collaboration with our sister team out at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, um, the work wouldn't have been possible without the sponsors, and in particular, the uh, LPS who sponsored this work. And thank you for your attention. Do we have time for two questions? Sure. Uh, 
No, we haven't tried that. So if I understand correctly, when you do multiple uh, points of the wave, a couple to the same qubit, you're just bringing them close to the same capacitor. But you began the talk by saying that you had this qubit which had a capacitor pad, and then the other capacitor pad was the ground point. Uh, what would happen, or could you, or anyway, uh, <laughs> Uh, what would happen if you use two discrete capacitor pads and you couple the qubit, you know, the, the, the weight guide rather to other sides of the same uh, qubit? Yeah, so that that's pretty interesting. So let me step back first. The, the question was about the capacitors that we use. And I want to emphasize there are two capacitors. One I showed and one I didn't really show that much. So one was the qubits capacitor. As, you know, it's an LC nonlinear resonator. And that was the one where you had the square and then the ground plane. So it's a lateral capacitor. The second one, I showed it, but I didn't really call it out, which is just that the waveguide comes near one of those plates, and that's the other capacitance. Okay, now it's an interesting question, and it gives you a nice tunability that if you somehow threaded that between the two plates of the qubit capacitor, you probably have a much better control over the coupling strength between them, and it becomes more symmetric. There's probably some nice features of doing that. Um, in some sense, it's um, you know, you know, a, a differential approach to designing this um, coupling capacitance. Yeah. Sure. So it seems like a lot of the uh, architecture depends on there being only one photon. Mm -hmm. So if you start thinking of this in terms of interconnects, how much you have to worry? If, you know, this is probably way down the road, but well, let's hope not. <laughs> photons traveling, so you have to be careful. Yeah, that you don't lose this interference. That's right. So, so in this case, um, the idea would be that we want to connect an a an emitter and an absorber, and so there should only be one photon connecting them at a time, and we want to bypass all the other emitter and absorbers. So we'll detune those. Now we can imagine that we might want to do some of this in a multiplex sense. Right, so while these this emitter and absorber is at this frequency, I can have another pair at a different frequency. That's still in the single photon limit because what matters is frequency separation. Now, if they get too close together, okay, details are important, but we can run several of them in parallel, in principle, as long as they're separated in frequency enough that um, they bypass the ones we don't want to get absorbed in. Yeah. Maybe this is a bit of a confusion on my part, like. Uh, I assume this doesn't really consider like propagation law in the way guys like and you have this comment that like you can make it like arbitrarily long. I did say almost arbitrarily. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, issue like when like try to like imagine using that as like a real interconnect like. I don't think in practice it will be, uh, certainly not lost. These are superconducting waveguides and you can calculate the loss. Um, now, at DC, a superconductor is perfect, right? But at AC, it's not, it has a little bit of loss. But that loss would translate to something like kilometers. <laughs> so in this sense, it doesn't really matter. But, but what may happen or become important is um, that as these get too far apart, um, that you may have timing issues that need to, will come into play. I mean, they, that will happen and they, those need to be calibrated yeah. depending on which pair you're trying to connect together. And like, if you think about the standard cavities that we use, the average number of round trips are like 10,000 or 30,000. And so that yeah. sort of says how many of those you can chain end to end and still have things be pretty reasonable. That's Indeed, awesome. yeah. One last question. Any questions? Sure. But uh, you answered the bill that there is no two photons, just not one photon in this way. Uh, can I think of this that a uh, flying photon is coming in and then um, it's like an antenna? Mm -hmm. They want to match the phase of this outgoing photon, they're not a traveling photon. And if that is the case, if I add more qubits with the right phase degree of freedom, it means that actually I can store a single photon into like a very contrived superposition of phases between multiple qubits. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, uh, atomic ensemble situation. I believe so. And, you know, in the first part of the talk, we did talk about coupling a qubit at three points, right? 
Um, I believe that that extension can also happen here. We didn't do it, right? But but I think that it's interesting to start exploring. You know, you know this was just the first attempt, and uh, there's just clearly a lot more to do. Yeah. So thanks. All right. So I think that means it's lunchtime. Let's thank Will again. Okay.